Hello, and a very warm welcome to the No Code Playbook, Grand Release. The day we've all been waiting for has finally arrived. Absolutely. Today we're joined by thousands of people from around the globe, everywhere from the US and Canada, all the way down to New Zealand and Indonesia. And we're not surprised. No code is a very hot topic nowadays. It allows companies to deploy business applications and automate workflows much faster and much more efficiently than traditional development methods. So what is the No Code Playbook? It's a hands-on guide built specifically to organize the No Code development process the playbook addresses the industry's most pressing questions and provides a very practical toolkit for technology, digital and business leaders. Right. There are a lot of useful tools and concepts included in the playbook, such as principles of no code, stages of no code lifecycle framework, application complexity assessment matrix, governance framework and many more. So, we decided to organize this digital show to share all of that with you. In the first part of it, we will get inspired by a futuristic conversation with the Silicon Valley icon, Steve Wozniak. Yes, you heard that correctly. Steve will share his thoughts about the future of technology, software and innovation. After that, the authors of the No Code Playbook will present its key concepts. And we also have our exciting client, Virgin Media O2 Business, that will showcase how they would build a new application following the playbook very quickly, efficiently, and with the maximum degree of freedom. One more thing, though. During the show, you have a chance to win a signed copy of the No Code Playbook. Feels like Christmas. <laughs> It's now time to listen to what Steve has to say. We are thrilled to have a very, very special guest here today with us. An inventor, the tech icon, co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak. Steve, welcome, and we are thrilled to have you here today. It's, it's such an honor for me. <laughs> As you know, the No Code Playbook is about the future of business software. Mm -hmm. But prior to talking about the future, we need to understand our past. Your Twitter sign is amazing, engineers first. I'd love to hear your observations of different generations of engineers. How has the uh, profession of engineers evolved over time? Well, in the 50s, I didn't know professional engineers. I was a young student in school, and there were no computers in school, but there were radios. Television had just come into our life, and then television got, got colored instead of black and white, and I just somehow was always attracted from books I read and things like that. My father was an electrical engineer, and I wanted to be an electrical engineer, and I got good at it. I studied, I studied, I got built transmitters and receivers, and I tapped out, you know, telegraph keys and all that stuff. Uh, as I grew up, I built a lot of science fair projects that won awards, and I built things I could show off to my friends, but it always worked or it didn't work. And to me, that was truth versus lie. Mm -hmm. You had to be accountable. You had to make it so it worked. And uh, I felt truth was the most important thing in the world, and I decided engineers were the most honest people in the world because they get judged on what they do. Does it work or not? They don't just formulate words and ideas and could go this way, could go that way, and toss it around. Uh. And by the way, uh, did father influence your decision actually to become an engineer, I wonder. Well, I, I would say that what he did, watching him doing ah. his work influenced me, but he didn't ever push his values on us. Okay. He would always explain, here's some type of people do this, some type of people do that, you choose. It was right. always a you choose for yourself. But um, eventually I had, I had built products for that people would like. Yeah. And I, I went through the games, the video games. Um, I even designed a breakout for Atari. It's a very famous game. Then I got into uh, the, the early terminal, the ARPANET, where stretched out computers across the world. They were across the country. There were only six computers on the ARPANET. I had to be part of it, so I built a device I could type send signals through my phone line and get signals back from the computer that would appear on my TV. And that was just about a computer, but the computer was far away. So this time I said, no, I want a computer that I type directly into and get answers right on my, right on my TV screen. And that's human, it's like a typewriter. When I built the Apple II computer, the, the, not, the, not modifying my terminal, but really building a computer from the ground up. I built it as a color TV generating system. Yeah. And I was, it figured out a way to get color on the color things in your computer for zero dollars instead of 5,000 okay. to get them on the color TV. And that told me that a person can go in and type, put a little red dot here, type a little part of a program. Nine year old kid could do that. Put a blue dot there, make them move. So let's talk about the skills mm -hmm. a little bit. So what are the skills that 
knowledge workers nowadays need to have to be successful in the digital world. Because you can see knowledge workers without any special technical skills, without even special technical education, they can build things to automate their companies as well. So what are the special skills that you believe everyone in the world, every knowledge worker, not, not, not only engineers, need to have nowadays? Well, knowledge workers, you know, in the past they tended to need uh, be engineers partly too, and uh, have all the skills of the dig the hardware, electronics, and the software, and piece it together. And today, knowledge workers often come from a higher point of view. Mm -hmm. We've come from the ground up already, the bottom up, but now we want to go from the top down. Here's an envisioned architecture, and we want to work our way down and create it mm. and hire the teams that do it. But, uh, you know, now it's pretty much, you know, well, let's say garages are all kind of built. They're already designed. Why would I want to redo the past and redesign something that's there? So I want to use, base, uh, based on other people's expertise, what they've done, use chunks of them and basically shortcut the process. You don't really learn that way from the start. You got to. Uh -huh. You kind of have to go through some school of building stuff on your own, some processes, and then understand what's going on before you're just, you know, picking pieces and saying, "I'll direct this." Um, and I like, I like, you know, what Creatio is about. I mean, code, you know, codeless uh, design. It's kind of like I visited a, a famous professor at Carnegie Mellon once, uh -huh. Randy Pouch, and he demonstrated this program called Alice. And you just basically had little ideas and pieces that you put together and you were using the elements of a programmer, but you didn't have to learn deep little programming commands and all that. And, exactly. and I, love the, I love the results. And you also, these days, you very much want to combine your product making, call it engineering, with, uh -huh, uh -huh. with um, creative design. Uh -huh. The design and, you know, looks and how it fits together. So you kind of need, you know, the overall, you know, vision. Right, called, right. Yeah. And, and Steve, let's talk about innovations in general, right? So when, when we think about an innovator, your name comes to mind like that would be the first name on the list. Do you see more innovations these days in comparison to 70s, 80s, for example? It's a very tough question to me because I see a lot more innovation today than, well, the 70s. Because personal computers and all that they led to has been so successful and such an important part of our life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, oh my gosh, a lot of people got in there. I can start companies and I can be part of, you know, making the world, taking the world forward. An awful lot of people. But now have we plateaued, you know, we see innovation, innovation. Every company that does anything to a product, uh, just buy the newer chip and say it's faster, we innovated. No, yeah. where's the innovation? It's down at the bottom level of physicists and chemists, you know, designing better parts. But, um, but every company you go to just thinks we've got to have something new. It's the only economics is the driving force. And to have something new, we've got to innovate. That yeah. means make something that didn't quite exist in that form before. And then we can, it's easy to market and sell it. I, I can tell you that at Creatio, it's all about bringing value. Like how can we innovate to bring more value to our users, to our end users, mm -hmm. to no coders. That's how we call uh, the users of Creatio. So what is the main driver of innovations from, from your perspective? Well, main drivers are we're born with curiosity. Yep. And so some of us just want to be inventors, and inventors implies innovation. Also, um, you, you've got to have a mix of a few inventive minds, suggestion, ideas, and this and that. But you've got to have a two-way street. They've got to be heard by their manager. And that's got to be communicatable all the way to the top of the organization. Um, to you know, Because people come up with these clever ideas that are really good, that could be, you know, the big product for the next 10 years for the company. Innovation is usually a different approach or something different, and it's harder to see the direct impact on our bottom line this year. So long-term thinking is, um, is, is crucial. You've got, you got to mix the two, and that means top management from the CEO down. Now, disruptors will come along. Disruptors will come along with a whole new approach that you don't see in advance. And I suggest that companies have a chief disruption officer with a team not located near the central office and the CEO. Okay. CEO's got to keep the money going short term. <laughs> okay. just chief disruption officer should report to the board of directors and have a team and look at all these new little technologies that aren't worth any money right now. Mm -hmm. But somebody figured out a different way to make batter. Somebody figured out another there and analyze it and see if any of these might come through to fruition where economically they're a big challenge to what we do now. Talking about the future, what do you believe is gonna wait for us and for our lives and businesses in the future, how the business organization is gonna evolve, let's say over 10 year period of time, how will organizations change over 10 years? Well, we, the end users of it, are gonna have a lot more easier life, a lot of things created for us, and just basically relieve us of a lot of the things in life. But there are negatives too. 
And good companies have to watch out and say, we aren't going to take advantage of people. We're going to let them buy something and actually own it. And we're not going to you know, pretend like we're more important than the end users. Always feel the end user is most important. Look at great products like my Apple II, like Steve Jobs' iPhone, like Elon Musk's Model, um, Model S Tesla. Mm -hmm. And they all came from a person who wanted something for themselves. It has to be right for me. And it turned out it was right for an awful lot of the rest of the world. Brilliant. Steve, what, I, what you created gave a chance to ordinary people do absolutely extraordinary things. Even myself. <laughs> including yourself, right? <laughs> including yourself. So I'd love to understand more or hear your advice to uh, IT leaders and digital leaders over there. What actually you need to keep in mind when you create something new to give such a huge value as you gave uh, to people? What is the end user? You have to put yourself in that place. If I were the end user using this, how would I feel? And what features would I call good? And how would I like it to work and not otherwise? And keep yourself true to that. The best of all is if you are that person. Okay. This is something I've wanted in my life and this is how I want it to be. This is how I envision it. And, and I get to create it the way it would be for myself. Tell me about the journey itself, like the, the whole journey with Apple, you, you got the idea, you started building it, you had so many ups and downs, so many ups and downs. What was your big inspiration in front of you? Well, first of all, in the early days, this was an early company, it was a startup, we were so far ahead of the world, we were the lead of the leaders of the revolution, we could price our product anywhere we wanted and not have to borrow money to get there. And nobody left the company for like two years, we knew we were changing the world. Right. Well, what can I say? Steve, thank you very much for changing the world. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'm glad to be a part of it that got changed. I got thank it too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great having you here. Wow, that was powerful. I must say I'm a big fan of Mr. Wozniak's. I would agree. I think Steve is a great example of a creator on a global scale, the person who changed the industry. Totally inspiring. So. We're moving on to the next part of our show. The authors of the playbook themselves, Creatio CEO, Catherine Kostareva, and a prominent software product leader, Burley Kawasaki, will now present the no-code playbook for us. Catherine and Burley will walk us through the 12 stages of the no-code lifecycle, sharing practical examples, tips, and hints. Of course, we don't have enough time to cover all the material published in a playbook. However, I think we'll get enough to understand the key concepts and how to use the framework. Absolutely. In the meantime, our customer Virgin Media O2 business will illustrate how the framework will work in practice. Their business operations and strategy team will showcase how they would build an application that they're calling in delivery using the no code playbook process. I would love to see that. Thank you, Eric and B. I'm very excited to present our no-code playbook together with my good friend, Burley. I believe it will change the game for so many enterprises out there. We're aiming to empower every company to enjoy the freedom of owning their automation thanks to no-code. I would agree. Today we have this great opportunity to leverage the power of the no-code approach. But before we move on, Catherine, why don't we start with sharing why we've decided to create the no-code playbook in the first place? Every business is now a software business. Digital transformation is at the forefront of the C-suite agenda. According to the predictions, within the next few years, organizations will deploy over 500 million apps. It's the same number of applications developed in the last 40 years, Burley. Most of these new apps will define the ability of the organization to compete at the modern world. And that's exactly where no code comes to play. So what exactly is no code? Simply put, no code allows non-developers to participate in the app development process through visual drag and drop tools. Right, and the benefits of the no code are very powerful. It is faster to start, it is faster to finish. No code brings much better alignment between business and IT and enables enterprises to be agile and responsive to market changes. Put it simply, your ability to compete, thrive, and grow depends increasingly on software innovations. We have written this book to equip organizations around the globe and help them embrace this no-code approach. It's meant to be an overview of the full life cycle of building a no-code app 
So it's a great reference if you are new to the process. Whether you are a CIO, a COO, a project manager, or an analyst, we believe you'll find this approach to be very useful for your no-code transformation. Catherine, shall we talk a bit about the principles of no-code development? Absolutely. There are three major principles of no-code development that we're highlighting in the playbook. Principle number one, use no-code to gather the requirements and prototype on the fly. With no code, we don't need additional documentation. There is also no need to use external tools for that. Everything can be done in the platform. This will save your time in the end. The second principle is very straightforward. Everything that can be developed with no code should be developed with no code. This principle is about minimizing the complexity of your solution architecture by adopting a primary architecture of no code. Early, let me also talk about my favorite principle, as you know. Deliver to end users as fast as you can. The markets move quickly. And it's better to release something impactful and relevant very quickly, rather than to bite off a massive set of functionalities all at once and face a lot of delays. To illustrate the principle and the framework of the no-code playbook, we have invited our prominent customer, Virgin Media O2 Business, and they will demonstrate how they use the no-code playbook in real life. Berlin, let's have a look at what's happening right now in their London office. Let's do it. Hello, my name is Andrea de la Puente and I'm leading the business and strategy department in Verde Media O2 Business for market development. My main duty is to bring a digital transformation to the team. Uh, today we would like to talk about a specific business case that we automated. The case is called in delivery. Basically, with no code platform, what we are trying to automate is the uh, service management and the service in delivery for our customers. I'm going to be the stakeholder to the project, and the no code platform provides great value to our business users. I'm Jenny Beer, Director of Pre-Sales, and I have a background in business consulting and no code. And I am definitely not a software developer, but I'm very excited about no code and what it brings to businesses. I'm Andrew. I look after the business in Europe and Australia and New Zealand, and I've been in the industry for coming up to 30 years now. But it's absolutely amazing to be empowering Virgin Media O2 business with Creatio's no code platform. All right, now let's roll into the 12 stages of the no-code playbook process. They are broken down into three major phases, design, go live, and everyday delivery. Let's start with the design phase. At the design stage, you collect and organize information that will shape each step of the development journey and ensure it can fit in within your plans. In order to make full use of no-code benefits, it is important to recognize fundamental differences in the design phase of the no-code project. Traditionally, design activities in software development involved a high degree of technical notation and abstraction that required also a high level of technical skills. That's why design work has often been done by developers or technical architects. However, the roles are fundamentally different in no-code projects. Business stakeholders and end users are more directly involved in the design itself because no-code tools are more accessible to non-technical people. And the design phase consists of four different stages. Number one, business use case, then options analysis, number three, design and prototyping, and finally, project assignment. The business use case serves as the vision for your entire project. At its most simplistic level, the business use case should define the following. Number one, no-code stakeholder. Then the business process that needs to be automated. The use case itself, process consistency, and finally, success criteria. The no-code stakeholder is the primary business owner of the requirements and is the person ultimately accountable for representing the sponsoring business function. 
The best way to frame the requirements for a no-code app is by describing the highest level definition of the business process that will be addressed. You will want to describe the business vision by decomposing the impacted processes into smaller units, often referred to as process use cases. Lastly, how do you measure success? The no-code stakeholder should specify this. Sounds great, Burley. Shall we take a look how Virgin Media O2 Business is actually working on this stage? That would be wonderful to see. The objective of the in-delivery process is basically to give us visibility to understand how our products are being delivered. The workflow of this process starts when um, the contract is signed and then it will raise a request to the product owners and the sales team to confirm that the data on the delivery it correlates to the information uh, that the customer has signed in the contract. After the sales team and the product owner have confirmed that the data is correct, we will need an approval for the delivery. The product owner will confirm that the product was delivered and at the same time, the date that it was delivered. The date is very important for the next step, revenue recognition. This is a critical stage for us. Since this is such an important stage, can you stop and just tell us more about this one? Correct. And let me clarify that a little bit. Basically, one once we know that the product has been delivered and when it has been delivered, what we will do is to start recognizing the revenues on our books since that date onwards. Okay, and Andrea, would this be where an invoice is raised and then we, we track the invoice? Correct. Actually, the last step of the process would be invoicing. Creation is gonna help us to track the status of the invoices, whether we need to raise an invoice or whether a invoice is being delayed. However, we use a different system for actually using the invoice to customers. Great, I think this process really makes sense. Tell me about the key metrics you'll use to make sure it's successful. So the main KPI that we will use is the percentage of deliveries within the service level agreement. Now we can move on to our next stage, options analysis. First, let's start by reviewing the traditional development options available for most enterprises. Typically, it is a choice between buy, which is a packaged application, versus build, which is custom development. You can think of no code as providing a new third alternative that offers the best of both worlds. However, not all of the cases should be deployed with no code. The options analysis stage allows us to navigate through these choices. Correct. Now at this stage, you should ask yourself four questions. First, how standardized is your overall business process? Next, how much customization is needed to meet your business needs and provide a competitive advantage? How technically complex is your use case? And lastly, are there specific subcomponents that could be integrated? If an organization is automating standardized, repeatable, and simple processes, packaged application might be the way to go. If there is a need to heavily customize a legacy application, and it's too difficult and expensive to move to a new platform, custom development may be the best option. Finally, use no code for all applications that have a degree of uniqueness and that can help you to gain a competitive advantage. Now let's go back to Virgin Media O2 business and see what options would work for their in-delivery business use case. Look, let's step back. Um, let's look at the delivery options that we have here. Uh, we've got packaged applications off the shelf through to custom uh, bespoke development. And if we look at VMO2 businesses' needs, um, they're unique, okay? Um, taking a packaged app, configure, configure, through maybe even customization, you start to unwind the reason why you picked off the shelf package in the first place. And then starting at the other end with a blank screen and starting with code from scratch, it's, it's very laborious, it's very time consuming, it's costly and it's also hard to maintain. So this is why I very much would recommend the no-code platform with composable apps, okay? We can really incorporate VMO2 business needs, the unique requirements, and harness the ready-to-use components, whether that's 
order management, whether it's contract management, these ready-to-use components really accelerate the implementation. I fully agree with that approach. Um, I think the combination of flexibility and ready-to-use applications is exactly what we need. So yeah, let's do it. I would agree. The no-code with composable apps is the best strategy for the client in this case. Now, our next stage is design and prototyping. It's time to dive into it. A no-code creator should define an app with all of the needed parameters using the no-code tools, such as fields, dashboards, UI, workflows, and make changes on the fly when presenting and evolving a prototype. This helps to drive very strong alignment and eliminates the necessity to go back with other prototyping software. This stage consists of the following steps. UI UX design, number one. Workflow and business logic design, number two. Integration design. And finally, dashboards and analytics. We're not building the full-fledged app yet. Instead, we're using the no-code tools to get aligned with the stakeholder. On the UI UX step, we can validate the look and feel of the planned application. The workflow part helps us understand how exactly the process will be executed from both the user and system actions perspective. The integration design doesn't need to include the ready-to-go complex data exchange. However, at this point, we can perform data import and set up a few SOAP REST services to illustrate a data exchange. And finally, nothing helps the stakeholder to understand the application purpose more than dashboards and analytics. Design and prototyping is an exciting stage. Let's see how this stage can be performed for the uh, Virgin Media O2 business. So now I want to show you the prototype that we've put together based on the conversations we've been having about your specific business case. So here we are in the application hub and you'll see that we have the form page, which is what they will use to open a, a delivery request and be able to see all the information. And we'll also have a home page, which they could use as that like dashboard that they see the first thing in the day. I want to focus on the product in delivery page here. This is where we would be prompting them to enter detailed information about the request, as well as populating information about uh, maybe the sale or the contract so they can see everything in one spot. So this page would be automatically generated after a contract is signed? That's correct. And then we could show information. So you'll see that I have kind of a template here for our prototype. You saying the contract makes me think we probably need to have another element here. So I can just copy this one and maybe... Something around the sales detail, I'd say. That. Yeah, we can have the sales detail and then we could also link to the contract so that they'd be able to view that information right here on this page. So this would pull the contract through so they have instant visualization. That's right. And we can take other information from the contract and put it on this page, or they could click this link and then view the, a separate page about the contract. Brilliant. And Andrea, um, is there a relationship, I think, between a product and the, the owner of the product? Correct. Yes. So Jenny, we spent some time earlier um, with Andrea talking through the process uh, with the boxes on the uh, flip chart. And I'm wondering whether we can build in the dynamic case management, the workflow to actually support those boxes. Yeah, I'm going to bring over this action dashboard and we're going to drop this in here so that we'll be able to have that workflow component right here on this page. So again, everything is in one place for them. So to do that, we're going to set up the cases and we can set those up to exactly match the process you drew on the flip chart. So I think one of the first ones we would want to call this is in progress. And then we went to canceled uh, just in case you needed to cancel this request entirely. So we have our high level boxes across the top and then we want to add in any of the specific tasks that would happen within those higher level boxes. What about if I want to lock this stage if it wasn't approved? Yes. So what we can do is say uh, that this has a required step. So I can actually add this approval and we could say that they need to approve product delivery request. And then we can make that this approval required. And then I can also change some elements here uh, for this stage so that I'm not able to move on until that approval is completed. And 
Um, we talked earlier in revenue recognition about the connection here to tracking invoices, and this is where we can jump down a level of detail to, to track uh, within a step. Yeah, that's right. So I think what would make sense is we could call a sub process. When we get to revenue re recognition, we could call a process in order to go call the other system to pull in that invoicing information. And now we've gotten to the last stage of the design phase, the project assignment. To successfully conclude it, we need to complete a few steps. First, decompose the business use case down into smaller use cases and define the MVP, or minimum viable product. We strongly believe that the first release should take days or weeks, but not years or months. Thus, we need to define an MVP that will bring a lot of value to the stakeholder and the users. However, it needs to also be delivered very quickly. After that, we need to apply the application matrix to understand the application complexity and determine the right development strategy for it. The application matrix evaluates your no-code project from three different dimensions, business, governance, and technical. And it suggests how exactly you need to go ahead about deploying the app. Absolutely. The business complexity dimension helps to assess where your app sits regarding the spectrum of the business process and organizational complexity. Next, the governance complexity helps assess the spectrum of requirements for things such as compliance with laws, external, external and internal guidelines, and regulations. It will also assess the complexity of the security and user permissions. And finally, the technical complexity dimension helps assess where your team may require assistance from either software developers or from specialized technical resources. For simple apps, we can use a do-it-yourself strategy where a business unit or an individual can deploy it by themselves. For medium complexity, we use a center of excellence strategy engaging a specialized unit responsible for no-code projects. And finally, for advanced business critical applications, we would use the fusion team approach, where multidisciplinary teams with both IT and business domain knowledge will be working on creating an app. I'm curious to see how complex is the in-delivery app and which strategy will be most relevant. Let's take a look. The business case is pretty straightforward, so I don't think we need to break it down to reduce the scope of the MVP. I think we can do it all in one. Um, and that'll include the UI for the forms, as well as the automated workflow, the visual metrics, and the analytics to be able to prove the business outcomes. Yeah, and if we look at how best to deliver this app, OK, um, we turn to the application matrix. We use this matrix to assess the complexity, OK, through three different lenses, the business lens, the governance lens, and a technical lens. And this allows us to work through. So if we take the business complexity, we've got market development, OK, four or five departments all interacting within that. Um, we have a customer-facing aspect to this application, which is really important. It's not mission critical, it's really important. So we would classify this as a medium business complexity. And if we look at the governance, we've got customer data there. It's really important. It requires uh, aspects like GDPR, but it's not sensitive data. It's not transactional or credit card information. Okay, And again, we would classify this as a medium complexity from a governance perspective. From a technical requirement, uh, we've got a fairly straightforward um, integration here. We've got the single integration with a straightforward API. Um, so this allows us to say, well, actually, this is a simple uh, level of complexity from a technicality perspective. So stepping back, using the application matrix to allow us to work out the best delivery for the application, then definitely we would be recommending the center of excellence uh, delivery type. I would agree with such an assessment. The project assignment stage now brings us to the end of the design phase. So let's now review the go-live phase. The go-live phase begins the actual development of your no-code app. How does it differ from traditional software development? Well, first, in no-code, the business acts as a direct participant in the development itself. Secondly, there's a unique opportunity with no-code to gather user input much earlier in the process. The go-live phase traditionally includes four different stages. In prototype to MVP stage, we begin the process of building the MVP functionality. During the feedback loop stage, we capture the feedback. 
And finally, uh, the governance check stage. It is a critical step of the review process to ensure your app has been cleared by applicable checklists and is ready for production release. At the end of this phase, the first release stage happens. This is where the application is released actually to production. So let's talk briefly about prototype to MVP. The MVP design steps will be performed visually inside the no-code platform, resulting in a very efficient, lean, and iterative approach. Our goal is to take the approved prototype and make it work. This includes expanding the UI, UX, fully automating workflows, and adding business logic, and setting up the full-blown integrations and analytics. Let's see this process in action with our client. Well, we're going to take a look at the MVP now, which is taking that prototype that we just looked at and workshop together, and we've added a couple of things. So here you can see that we have this home page. So each user, when they log in, they'll be able to view all of the deliveries um, and some, some quick actions here on the home page, as well as some of those key metrics. And then from this page, we can actually go in and open up one of the delivery quests. And here you're able to see that workflow that we were talking about, that DCM and the tasks. So where we had the flip chart with all of the boxes, we mapped them out in the DCM, prototyped it, we're now in the MVP. That's right. And then we have um, these that we can roll up and see in that bigger picture view too. Can we look at some KPIs? Yeah, so here on the home page, you can see that we have the number of deliveries to process as well as the gauge for tracking our tasks for today. If you think that there's anything that we might want to add, we could easily do that now too. Can we, for instance, add to see how many products are per status? Sure, we could go here. Since that's such an easy change, I think that's something we can implement just in real time. So we can actually just come into this application hub and go ahead and just drag and drop this new chart onto our home page. So I'll just take that element and I'll just select that it's for orders and we'll save it. And then we can just reposition this so that it looks really great. And then we've already implemented that change since this, this is something oh, that's really easy. Quick. Nice. The next stage is the feedback loop. Continuous focus on listening to your customer and responding to their needs will drive higher levels of customer satisfaction. And the same is also true for being successful with your no-code app. Your ability to listen to and respond to quality feedback will significantly improve your odds of exceeding expectations of your business users. The success of the feedback loop stage lies in constant collaboration between the no-code team and stakeholders. The feedback loop is an incredibly important stage of the process. So are the governance checks. Just because no-code allows for rapid and incremental updates doesn't mean that you can ignore governance requirements. Proper governance is essential to maintaining security and compliance at all times. Now, let's begin with identifying some of the more common types of governance. External compliance checklists assess compliance with external laws, guidelines, or regulations imposed typically by external governments, industries, and organizations. A great example would be HIPAA, or say PCI DSS. Internal compliance checklists, on the other hand, are imposed by internal audit teams to enforce the rules, regulations, and practices as defined by internal policies and controls. Security checklists to protect your corporate information resources from external or internal tax. Then data governance checks assess how sensitive corporate data is managed. Keeping up with the speed of business is important, but so is the proper governance of the application. Let's see now how each stage is being performed by Virgin Media O2 Business. Great, so look, back to um, governance checks with the application matrix. Clearly we, we know we've got some GDPR here. It's great that we can deal with that via our reusable, composable apps, but we ought to get sign-off from the data protection officer. Yes, we receive it and um, the team agreed to that. Brilliant, okay. So like any application, a really important part is user permissions, making sure that they're appropriate and safe and secure. So we ought to check with internal IT. And Jenny, we ought to implement this via our in-app checklist. Yep, and I just ran it actually, so we're good to go. Brilliant. 
Congratulations with the first release. You've passed the governance checks, and you're ready to deploy your initial MVP release of the no-code app. The stages in the no-code lifecycle leading up until now have ensured that the application has met all the stakeholder, user, and governance requirements. However, there are still some final steps to prepare the business to use the application. Final user acceptance is required before we push the first release to production. We need to establish operations readiness by defining the right deployment support and user onboarding approach. And finally, we need to educate and enable the end users. We won't go into the details in this presentation, but of course, the playbook includes a lot of useful and detailed tips on how to organize your first release. Now, up to the next phase, everyday delivery. The ability to continually evolve is critical for your business and therefore for your no-code app as well. Now that you've delivered the first release, this is not the end. In fact, this is just the beginning. The everyday delivery phase provides value delivery in small, quick, and continual updates. Everyday delivery builds on concepts from Agile, but doesn't force you into strictly defined release durations. Instead, you can release when you are ready. You can get feedback from your stakeholder and end users and more quickly respond to this feedback. This creates an opportunity to release new micro use cases to end users in very small incremental steps, perhaps even daily. So let's start to examine in more detail what a no-code everyday delivery phase actually looks like. Feedback collection. This stage ensures that you have a model put in place to collect regular feedback from your stakeholders and end users so that you can respond quickly and systematically. Incremental improvements. This stage starts developing a constant stream of incremental improvements based on the feedback collected in the prior stage. Everyday delivery. This stage is all about delivering ongoing releases of functionality as soon as they are ready for deployment to end users. And finally, application audit. This final stage provides ongoing support and management for the developed no-code applications to ensure their optimal health and fitness over time. It's time now to unfold the feedback collection stage. The first go-live release is a huge milestone, and it's easy to take your foot off the gas and allow things to coast but now is actually the time that you need to keep momentum going strong. So let's identify that there are three types of feedback inputs that we should be focused on collecting at this stage. Stakeholder feedback, end user feedback, and system feedback, which is data from application monitoring tools. You want to proactively put a process for collecting a blend of data from each of the above feedback types. Instead of trying to address all at once, it's better to strive to continuously improve daily based upon the real world feedback. The incremental improvement stage allows you to decompose all the feedback into micro use cases and get them delivered to the end users very, very quickly. You need to identify small incremental improvements, agree on the priorities with the stakeholder, and start delivering uh, them to end users regularly. And this stage is tightly connected to the everyday delivery stage. The spirit of the everyday delivery stage is striving to provide rapid updates to the end users and maintaining a high velocity and ongoing improvement cycle. The deployment can be based on a specific set of features without a need to connect them to a specific deadline. The modern no-code platforms enable you to use application lifecycle management capabilities. This allows the no-code teams to automate the deployment process, so there's no need for you to wait. The requirement discussed with the stakeholder in the morning could be delivered as a feature to the end user before lunchtime. Let's see how this works in practice with our case study. Is it possible to, for instance, use a KPI to see each of the products in their status? Yeah, I think that's something that makes sense to do on the home page so that they would have like that high level view. Um, and that's pretty simple to add. So let's go ahead and go to the application hub and add this. Uh, what do you think this pipeline chart seems like it would give them a good visual of what's available? Script. Would they like to have this um, for just filter to see only my pipeline, or do you think they want the whole team? So it would be nice actually to see both. Is okay. that possible? Yeah, that is. Let's just copy this one. So one I'll have is filtered, and this other one could show the full team. And maybe we can change the color and the title so that's not confusing. 
and moreover, Andrea, um, this can be role specific. So um, top level management might have very much a different KPI and want to see different information than the product manager compared to the individual contributors. So uh, diagrams and bar charts and um, all of the functionality can be role specific. That's a very good valid point because um, um, the product owners might want to see different KPIs on have this different visibility than a sales manager. All right, well, if you're comfortable with those changes, then we can go ahead and push them to production so that the users can start using it right away. That's fine. Yes, this looks great. Okay, great. Well, then let's do it. That was the everyday delivery in action, right, Burley? The final stage is application audit. Like any living organism, apps will take on a life of their own and evolve and change over time. While an app may have perfectly fit all of the business and organizational needs initially, as the business process changes and you continue to release everyday delivery updates, it should be reassessed periodically to understand how well it is still delivering on the expected outcomes. The audit should include the following types. First, auditing for app performance. This step helps use the data and metrics to understand the health of your application and prevent any issues. Next, auditing for obsolescence. Another important consideration is feature obsolescence. Over time, some features in the app might no longer be applicable and may need to be removed. Cleaning up unused or unneeded features will help keep the app fresh. Next, auditing process or organizational change. The business may have changed, the process may have changed, or perhaps both. So it's important for the no-code app features to be reviewed for needed updates. Next, auditing for governance changes. This is a very important step. Don't overlook the possibility of changes in the external or internal requirements, which may trigger you to reassess the type and frequency of governance checks. Last, auditing component reusability. We discussed this during the design phase, that one of the strategic benefits of using no-code platforms is as an enabler for a composition architecture. As no-code apps are built, there will likely be various components developed in each app that might have some suitability on a broader scale and is a candidate for reuse. And this brings us to the end of the process. But before closing it out, let's check with the team. How did they feel about the process? Well, that was fun, Jenny. Yeah, I really enjoyed these meetings. I think it's going to be a great product for them. Absolutely. I mean, what a day. We've showcased pretty much the no-code playbook. We've gone through uh, design. We've looked at go live. We've gone to everyday delivery. Uh, we have showcased the playbook. Uh, we have shown how it empowers teams to produce no-code platform to really scale at speed. Yeah, I think it'll have a huge business impact for them. It absolutely will, and we're really looking forward to continuing our work with Virgin Media O2 Business. Hope after this brief overview of the no-code playbook, you start feeling as excited as we are about the value the no-code technology brings to organizations. The playbook includes several chapters that we have not touched today. For example, how to set up a no-code center of excellence. What roles should be included there? We also share our thoughts on how to make no-code your organizational strategy and much more. We invite you to embark on the no-code journey. Not only it allows you to engage a white team in a collaborative process, but also enables a very different way of thinking about your digital transformation projects. It brings a lot of freedom to control and own your automation. No code can become your competitive advantage. It can also help you in your professional career as we observe a formation of a completely new labor market of creators. We hope the no-code playbook will become a living and breathing tool for all of you. As you start utilizing it, we would love to hear your feedback. And thank you, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, everyone. This was really, really useful. I think that the no-code playbook is super practical. I think I could build an application too. Absolutely. Uh, we can all be no-code creators. Just follow the process and don't forget to use the application matrix. I especially love the playbook's illustration and visual style. It's very slick and engaging. Well, this brings us to the end of the show. We truly hope you got inspired by Steve Wozniak and found the playbook concepts very practical and useful. 
Creatio empowers creators all around the globe to build applications and automate workflows with a maximum degree of freedom. And now you can use the playbook to organize efficient and secure development processes. For those of you who want to get a copy of the playbook, the electronic version is available on Amazon. Please scan the QR code to get the direct link. The printed version of the playbook will be available soon. Thank you for joining us and enjoy your day. See you soon.